Uh, thank you for coming on such the end of your day. I know it takes effort at this time. Um, today I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> our experience with implementing a, a software bill of materials system internally. And something we've learned in particular that was very important was this idea of making sure we created this core pillar piece called the software parts catalog first. And we did it well. And everything else followed from there. If that piece wasn't built right, the rest of the system could have been at risk. <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with this famous elephant parable. Um, but uh, basically, it goes where they had six blind people. Originally, that's how it went came out, didn't know what an elephant was. Each one went and touched a different part of the elephant. And they all came to slightly different conclusions on what it was. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I sometimes feel like the elephant is an S-bomb. And working with a lot of different teams uh, within our company, they all have slightly different requirements sometimes about what they want in an S-bomb. <clears throat> and we know that there are different activities going on. And we know that clearly um, security is driving a lot of it today. Licensing started it. Um, and what I'm in a position is we have to be able to support all these different teams and their different requirements around what an SBOM is. Okay. I think I'm going to just briefly start off with this notion of like some evolution that we've gone through with SBOMs. Um, you know, a lot of it started with licensing. And um, we were driven by, the same, by that reason. Back in 2006, I had to generate my first list of open source components in a Linux distribution. Um, and then SPDX came along. We adopted that because it solved a lot of our problems with sharing the data. But then um, even along that way, we actually got hit with the um, export compliance bug or issue. And we were forced to generate a bill of materials for that. Um, and basically, a lot of these activities, they'll have something very common. Come up with a list, right? And then find out what data you need metadata on top of that. Well, producing that list is very important. And that's one of the number one things we focus on in producing a high quality list of stuff, OK? But then from there, obviously, today, what's driving it is security. And I think that kind of got going with the heart bleed um, issue. And then solar wind didn't help. I mean, well, it helped a lot. It accelerated everything, right? Um, but what we're also seeing is functionally safe um, space is also going to need um, a good quality list of open source. Um, our company has products that are Functionally safe certified. If you don't know what that means, it simply means that if you have a piece of um, software or uh, hardware, like a robot being controlled by your software, you don't want to main or kill people. Okay? Or if you're getting into an elevator, you don't want people to get hurt or die. Right? So you have to have your so software functionally safe. I'm not saying that that's driving anything right now, but that's definitely on the horizon. The point is that we're seeing a lot of different needs around that. Another kind of evolutionary thread that happened in concurrence with that was this notion of, in the beginning, um, I remember when we required all our developers, when you grab the binary on the web, um, off the internet, we said you must grab the source from which it was built. right? We didn't want them to have a binary in-house and not be able to reconstruct it. So in my eyes, that was really the first need for a bill of materials with, with respect to the kind of software it was. Um, clearly, um, what took off after that was the notion of a package and apps. And that's what partly, largely what people think of a, of a part or a component. But we're seeing a lot of push around treating other things like parts or components, such as a Linux runtime. Um, we have, not only do we have a bill of materials for a Linux runtime, but we have products that actually ship with an instance of a Linux runtime. And that becomes a single line item in that bill of materials. Okay? So it's not just a package, but it's an entire product is one line item, even though if you looked at the Linux bill of materials, it's very extensive. So we need to start thinking about, we're forced to like, start producing a bomb in that context. Clearly, containers have really accelerated things as well. Um, a lot of people, again, we're really focused on packages. But we definitely have a need for treating the container as a single part item. And I'll give you an example of that. And clearly, this notion of collections of containers. I have two products that have north of 100 containers in it. Okay. And they all ship. And obviously, containers are comprised of packages, and packages are comprised of files. And we need to be able to model all that. OK. Now, there is obviously a lot of focus on creating a bill of materials worth producing um, you know, based on the formats. And that makes a lot of sense. We need to be able to exchange things seamlessly, frictionlessly. But one thing that we don't have a lot of discussion about is 
how do we get there? That's usually the output, the final step. We need to construct an internal data structure, right, of that product or that thing that we want to model as provide a list of stuff for. Um, but you know, do we ever have that discussion around what exactly is that data structure should be? And it clearly, if you're having all these different disciplines driving what requirements are, they're going to be slightly different for different disciplines. Well, naturally, um, everybody's probably producing some kind of what I'm going to refer to as an SBOM portal, some way of driving your portal generation. I'm kind of working backwards into how I see this problem evolving. <clears throat> and that um, as a, a portal can be many things to many people. For, within our organization, we have a thought of what that is, right? But basically, it's that tool that helps you generate stuff, a central place to go. But from before that, we realized that we needed an internal component catalog database from which every single component that ever ends up in any product is somehow registered there. Okay? And again, those components aren't necessarily always packages. They could be an entire Linux runtime. It could be one single component that gets put into that catalog. So the main point of this talk is to focus on that piece right there. And I felt like after all our experiences you know, going through this process, developing and redeveloping this kind of system, we needed to step back and get that part right before we could move forward, OK? And that's what I'm going to focus on here today. And for the starting point, one of the things we really want to you know, think about is what is the definition? What is a component? Um, do we have a formal definition? I know a lot of community groups are talking about this, and there's different you know, ways of thinking about it. We wanted to build a data model that can support all the different ways of thinking about it. OK, identity is clearly a big challenge for all of us when it comes to identifying a, a component, whether it's a package or whatever you have. Um, storing and retrieving, uh, obviously, that data has to be seamless. And finally, we are seeing this need for a lot of metadata. We see that with the SPDX development and their new introduction of profiles are really important to that. Okay, So um, I'm going to draw a quick analogy here um, using IMDB, because that's what I think this catalog is for us. You know, everybody, I assume, who, who here is not familiar with IMDB? OK, it's that single source of truth for most people for their movies. OK? And if I clicked on this, you know, to do a search for The Godfather, there's several different versions of The Godfather, just like you have several different versions of a part. You have Godfather 1 and 2 and 3. <clears throat> and then you might want to click on your, your component, the, the component you want. And up comes a whole list of very rich information about that particular movie. Clearly, you're going to find out the directors, the writers, the stars. You scroll down, you get all the information about the actors, the awards they've won. You can get the actual storyline. Even I remember one time as a parent, I would actually have to check parental guide before I had my son watch a movie. Right? It's a rich place, a central place, a single source of truth. And I think when we build our S-bombs, um, I think about that as having that single source of truth in-house. And think about what's the analogy to that is you might want to create a whole list of movies, your favorite comedies, your favorite documentaries, right? Each of those are releases. And those lists that you build, that whole list management part of it, is the, S is the um, SBOM portal. But you need a central database to start with, and, and you can work from there. Okay? Let me flip back. Okay. So let's jump in real quick and see a quick demo. OK. Um, suppose I typed in busy, and it'll do a search. It comes up with BizBox. Let's choose this component. Or it's like choosing a movie, right? Um, and then you're going to come up with, OK, this is not as sexy as IMDb, granted. Um, but the idea is there, is that you can, at your fingertips, grab in all this information about the part. Now keep in mind, we're going to talk about parts largely of different types. But here you have archive, which is the most common one we've been talking about. Um, you're going to have some other basic information like licensing, um, you know, file counts, and we're going to talk about why that's really important. Um, obviously, the description, and then we have profiles. Profiles are very analogous to what we're seeing in SPDX. In fact, a lot of the data that's stored in these profiles will be taken and be able to help produce profiles in SPDX. And you could add any number of profiles. <clears throat> I'll talk about how this is really a hybrid database of both SQL and non-SQL data. Those would be more like documents, but we'll get to that later. Um, <clears throat> So that's just a basic introduction to the, um, the, the way things are working. So in this presentation, what I'm going to do is I'm going <clears> to <throat> present the case for why um, this is an important thing to have, a software parts catalog, and that it's going to be designed independent of all the other pieces you might have in your 
bomb system. We talked about briefly how we'll talk about definition, identity, storage, retrieval, and metadata. I'll present the data model that we use. It's going to be always an evolving thing, but the data model is there to help us represent all those different kinds of parts you might have, whether it's a package or it's a container or a collection of containers or an entire product. Um, <clears throat> then I'll discuss you know, this notion of a catalog versus the SBOM portal versus your actual SBOM. And finally, I'll talk about the code and how we implemented it and then give a summary. Um, really quick, just to sync on concepts. This is a, an assumption <clears throat> most software, whether you're talking about an application, you're talking about a library, container, or an entire device runtime, all have this kind of composition, right? Notion of you grab a lot of open source, you pepper it in with um, some, you know, you have your proprietary software and then you pepper it in with some maybe third party, um, third party um, commercial. <clears throat> but then we also have the notion of containers, which just creates this situation where it becomes very exponential in types of things you have to um, accommodate. So <clears throat> this is what we've seen. Another trend we've seen over the last few years is the number of disclosures we're receiving from our teams. <clears throat> um, basically, back in 2022, we had about 120,000 components. That means of all our product lines, people are submitting those disclosures to us about what they think is in their product. Okay. All right, now I'm going to switch to that idea of defining exactly what I mean by software part. I, I've gone out of my way to use the word part because I don't want to be confused with what we traditionally think of as a component. Um, and in particular, it's a nice analogy. So I always think of the file as the most atomic unit. You might think of it as a simple screw or bolt or whatever. But then we know we have slightly more complicated things, like a library, which is a collection of these smaller parts, right? And we typically might represent that as a, li as a package. And, Again, you can have an application, or you can have multiple applications and multiple libraries in a package, and then you start to get something like more a small sub-assembly. And then we have this notion of a Linux runtime, which if you ever look at the bill of materials of a Linux runtime, could be quite extensive. <clears throat> then obviously um, we have the notion of a container um, that we want to represent um, as well, and then the entire product. And again, we need at times to represent an entire product because that becomes even though it's complex, it becomes a single line item in another bill of materials, which we can then drill down on. Now, let me just give you a quick um, demo of that. So I'm gonna <clears throat> put in our system is, uh, this is actually based on a real uh, internal solution we have. It's um, called over the air updates um, software. So basically you can imagine cars, you know, th these days you can, um, all, everybody can uplo upload updates to your car while it's sitting in your driveway. That's the over the air aspect, right? It doesn't matter exactly what the application is, but <clears throat> I want you to understand that there's basic two components to it, a client and a server. Now, if you look at this one, this particular part, it has type logical. What that means is we decided that we're going to make this new product called OTA, whatever, OTA system. That's logical, but it's comprised of two um, um, containers, okay? And if I go to the subparts of the container, you can see a client and a server. Those are actually container images. Again, this is logical, but if I click on one of these, you're going to see this is a container image okay, within our database. So it's not just a package. And then <clears throat> it's only consisting of one file because it's one image. But again, a container can be comprised of a lot of other pieces. So if I drill down and I select the, the client source, um, it's going to come up as container source. And if I ask for the subparts of that, I'm going to see a lot of open source packages, which comprise that container. And if I wanted to open up one, you'll see that's actually an archive. So what we're saying here is like, I can have a container be a component, right? As well as the archives making up the container, as well as the container image, as well as back all the way back to the logical component. Okay? This is something that I, 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 real, I realize most people are not going to have that need today, but I believe in, in two or three years, we're going to really have that need particularly when we have so many products right now made it comprised of containers. Okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I want to briefly touch on this one. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of discussion goes on. We're not the experts on this area. <clears throat> we needed a way to have an identity within our own system. There are a lot of good solutions already. Um, but the, the, there are, these are the solutions that people use today, and we think they're good ones, right? Um, yes? Super fast question. Uh, what time scale did it take you guys to put that software parts catalog together from beginning to 
beginning for your architect? Well, first of all, we built it on a lot of history of building the system over and over again over many years, right? And we've taken all that knowledge that we've learned about what works and what doesn't work. So we sat down, I would say, about a year ago with all that experience and said, all right, let's lay these requirements out and we put it together and about a year later, we're here. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna claim that we solved this problem. We just needed a way for us to uniquely define something when it's in our system. And the good news is all these ways of identifying um, uh, components today are very popular and we use them within our own system. We'll keep track of them, but we also needed a way to identify a package uniquely, and I'll show you why that is true in a second. And the solution we used is based on something we um, borrowed from SPDX, which was the package verification code, which I'm not sure how useful, how common that's used, but we found it to be extremely useful in our, our context. Okay, and what that is is basically, uh, the algorithm is really simple. We assume, first of all, parts can always be broken down to files. So if you obviously have a container, you can get the source. You can then get from the source of the packages and then from the packages you get the files, right? Same thing for any package and so forth. So that's an important assumption. And what we simply um, do is we then say, all right, for all the files for that, let's say take a package, take a busy box. We'll then gather all those files. Again, this is an algorithm taken from SPDX. We'll sort, um, we'll compute the uh, SHA-256 of every file. We'll put them into a, a list, a sorted list, and then take the SHA-256 of that, and then we'll have a, a unique identifier that we know, no matter what the package is called, whatever the name is, it doesn't matter, we can determine its identity based on its contents. And that's the important thing. We're not depending on an external source, although external sources are useful too, then there are good ways of doing it. But we found that we needed a way that if the world outside us changed, our identifier didn't. Now, I know that the um, Software Heritage Foundation also has a unique identifier, and they're trying to do something similar with being very intrinsic. It's called intrinsic kind of identifier. But we'll, we'll use theirs if they become more popular. But all the other ones that are being used today, we will represent in the catalog as well. So you can look up anything by their respective um, identifiers. So for example, if we had a Perl in there, you had a Perl, and we started with the part, you could look up the part based on the Perl. Okay. Um, Um, we, we're not yet, but we can, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, let me just go quickly into, um, uh, show you how that works. So, um, so I'm gonna click on SSH. Now, one thing you'll notice again is this is the file verification code that was computed. Now this is just a, the last 10 digits, okay? It's an abbreviation, you can copy and paste it here if you really wanted to see it. Um, I could show you, it's not always, it's not pretty, but um, I can just paste it here. And what essentially, you know, is a very long hex string, but ultimately um, that is used. And what's interesting is if I click here, you're gonna notice a bunch of packages come up, archives. These archives were uploaded to our system by different people, by different teams. They had slightly different names Interesting that some were called client, some were called server, some weren't even called anything. They're all identical. And it's very common for us to end up with an archive, the same content given a dozen different names. And if someone hacked the name, it doesn't matter. As long as you're looking at the content, the files, the file verification code will always be the same. So you'll notice here that just SHAs are all different, right, as well. And so are the, um, the names themselves. So, um, that's really important for us, okay? All right. Finally, um, something I've already talked about really briefly, and it's a very common thing we're seeing, especially coming out of the SPDX group, is this notion of creating profiles for different disciplines. And again, what we wanna do is, not only do we wanna support a whole collective set of parts, but we want every part to have a collection of profiles, and you can define your own profiles if you wanted to. Again, you have licensing, you have um, security, you have crypto. Um, crypto is really came out of the export world, because um, you had to understand the crypto in a given 
say, package it all in order to understand how to classify it for export purposes. Quality is simply you know, bugs as opposed to vulnerabilities. And then the build profile is something that we had to produce, actually, because one of our clients asked us, because I know they're getting certain regulations from certain governments. Okay? Obviously, there's a whole set of things that in the future we can support by simply creating a new profile. Okay? So we can extend what we store in the database. Um, if I went back to, I didn't really show you that when I went to the BusyBox one, but if I went back to home, went to Busy uh, Search. So um, licensing is really straightforward. And again, these can, fields can be added. This is just a JSON document, okay? And you can put arbitrary fields in, it doesn't matter. Um, but here we had an analysis done where um, you know, we, we had two different analyses done. One was through automation, one was through a, um, uh, a per human to validate it, and we can keep both of those. You have copyrights in your, your actual license um, notice, if in case you want to create a notice file. Um, you have security vulnerabilities. Um, this is something we just recently have added. Um, we we're gonna probably extend how, how comprehensive this could be. Um, we'll probably have VEXs as well. Yes? So what we're presenting here is what I refer to as the top level license. It's a good point, and, but we also store on every archive every single file, and every single file will have its own licensing information. So if you wanted to get a more comprehensive list of all licenses found, like for example, when you produce an SPDX file, you need to know that information. So like I told you, when we store in the database, every part is pointing to every one of its files. And though each file is stored, Yeah, every file has its own profile too. We, that, and I'll talk about that in the data model. We purposely did that because the atomic unit is so important to have as, as much information as possible because if one file is used across multiple packages, like different versions of that package, which is common, if you update that file record, it propagates to everything. Okay. Um, go back. Okay. So um, the next, uh, um, I just want to go over a very quick um, workflow. Um, everybody has their own workflow. This is not the workflow, it's just a workflow, okay? I just want to give you a workflow within inside our company to see how the catalog fits into the context of that, okay? So, really quick. Um, developers are responsible for disclosing, and eventually that disclosure has to impact the customer. And so what will happen is as they start to disclose, we start to construct a bill of materials. And then um, we have an API also, so they can batch submit hundreds of disclosures if they want at one time. Um, but most importantly, then we'll have some source code analysis composition go on, a composition analysis go on where um, they'll look at the integrity of the bomb um, and to make sure that the quality is high. Keep in mind, again, we want the best, highest quality list possible, and then all the metadata will follow. But if you miss something, you're not gonna have it in your list and it doesn't matter you know, whether you, you know, how good the metadata is. Um, and then we have an analyst, um, depending on what task they're working on, will reach out to different team members working through the bill of materials and they'll, they'll construct um, a set of reports. Those reports will go out to the release team. The release team will then bundle them up and then they get um, sent out to our customer. Now, the most important part I wanted to point out is that when something comes into our front door, our API, as I was mentioning, that one component will get stored in the, in the catalog if it's, the, if it's the first time it's ever been seen. But if it's been seen before, file verification code will tell us that. It'll just say, oh, here's another archive that maps to that file verification code. So there's one record for the part for all those archives. Um, and then what we'll do is um, <clears throat> it'll actually get into the SBOM portal <clears throat> and it'll be assigned to a release. And I'll tell you what, how the portal differs from the catalog in a second. But the other thing that I don't want to go into great details, we'll have this what I call the source um, forensics analysis engine. That's where we can perform all kinds of analysis and it'll populate the data to the part in the catalog. Again, remember, if one release points to that part, they all benefit. Now, if I click one further, you'll see that one part actually belongs in a variety of different releases, okay? And that's natural, right? Um, and so, again, there's only gonna be one record in the, in the database, but we know it's, it, it's peppered throughout all our releases. And then, obviously, from out of that, you're gonna get a bunch of reports. I just wanted to draw this distinction between the parts catalog and the SBOM portal. 
again, it's maybe natural for some to want to mix the two together, but we felt it was really important to keep them separate. Now, how do they differ? Um, in the most basic sense is the catalog contains what I call all intrinsic data, all right, that's independent about a release. There's nothing about the release about its usage, because keep in mind, all these releases are pointing to it. It can't know about a release. It shouldn't know about a release. But the release knows about it, right? But it'll, this is all I would call it um, intrinsic because they're factual true for that component regardless of how it's used, okay? And so this is the data that will go into the catalog, and that data may get extended over time as long as it doesn't violate that rule that it's independent of a release. However, the SBOM portal, whatever that means to you, right, that to me is where you're gonna store extrinsic data, right, release dependent. And, and that means clearly if you modified it, right, you patched it, that I wanna keep separate. Um, that's complicated, and keeping this relationship between all the parts and, and components within a release is, is complicated, so that's why that kind of portal is gonna be useful for that. Clearly, whether it's linked to other things like proprietary code or not, right, dependencies used, locations within the product. We'll have three different instances of ZLib used in a very complicated product. What happens if there's a problem with ZLib, that particular version of it? You wanna know where is it? Where, where are all the different parts? And a lot of times people wanna keep ZLib as one instance in the list. We wanna know that there are three instances of use of it, and so we wanna know every location within the product, okay? Um, obviously, a number of instances will be kept. Who disclosed it? Tool chain used. You can then start to record that information. Um, files used um, in the build um, as well. And dynamic dependencies are simply things that get sucked in during build as opposed to things that are just hardwired in. Okay, I just wanna make it clear that we, we saw a real important dis separation between these two sets of data and it was really important for us to maintain that as part of our architecture. Okay, um, what I'm simply highlighting here is that clearly also the parts catalog has a potential role to other things in your organization, independent of the SBOM portal, right? So for example, we will have the build pipeline may want to have access to a component and its data. You might have the security team have its own set of tools that want access to the catalog. And it shouldn't be hard, um, you know, um, sewed in tightly into the SBOM portal because this is a universal central source of truth within your organization, okay? Now, um, one thing I wanna point out, although I showed you a UI for the, the catalog, that's not its primary access, way of accessing it. The main way of accessing it is through GraphQL, a, a very um, well-designed um, technology for accessing queries. Instead of using a REST API, you can access data very easily, and most of the activity on the database happens through the um, GraphQL API. We have a CLI as well, and as I mentioned, we have a UI. Okay. Finally, I'll talk about the core te technologies we used. Um, and the, first I'll start off with the data model. Someone was asking about the file level. I think he left, but he, um, we actually do store everything. Um, every single file is stored for that component and we store profile information and, and everything. We treat every file as a first class citizen because if we learn something about that file, uh, we can store it there and everything that inherits that file will benefit from it, okay? The thing to understand here is it is the most atomic unit, but also, the, at the part level, we're gonna also have profiles. We, we, we have this data model allow you to support, our, as I said, an eclectic set of parts um, by simply setting the type field. Um, we, when I say we support multiple aliases, there's a lot of different ways people wanna to refer to a package. We wanna make sure we can capture all those aliases. You can store those as well. Those aren't necessarily identifiers. They're just nicknames for things, right? Um, we, we see um, identifiers or locators as a kind of a special class of stuff. Um, and then finally, um, again, profiles are at both the file and the part level. What we did to implement this, so we chose Postgres. Um, it's a fantastic you know, database. Um, what we, the one benefit I'll call out here due to time is that we chose it largely because it supports SQL structured data, which a lot of the part data is stored that way. But we also can store um, JSON objects or JSON documents, if you want to call that. That gives us those profiles, and we can extend that very easily. It's very dynamic that way. Um, and I thought that this was a huge um, benefit for us. Okay, um, I, I'll go through these quickly because you could read the slides of some of these benefits of why we chose them. Go is clearly a, a, a growing in popularity. It's a fantastic backend language. Um, it, you know, the concurrency support, um, it's, 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 you know, a better C, C++, basically. Highly readable, highly stacked 
uh, type checked, and so forth. Um, GraphQL, um, it's been a blessing because if we had to do this through a REST API, it'd be much more rigid, right, when you're dealing with accessing data. REST APIs have their benefits, right? I'll say one drawback to GraphQL is that if you want to change data, it's not as good. It's a little more awkward to call it and use it. Um, but if you're just doing a lot of accessing of data and you want to create endpoints, GraphQL is a fantastic way of creating queries and accessing the data over the, over the internet. Okay. Um, Vue.js. Um, I know a lot of people like React and Angular. Those are fantastic um, UI components. We, um, we looked at those. We looked at Vue. Vue was the up and coming guy. I think it learned a lot from Angular and React. It's clean, it's elegant, it's simpler. It's, um, it performs really well. I don't know if you're familiar with UI stuff. If you're not, that's not your thing. But this is one of the three, but the younger one on the block. And we found it to be really mature for our, our needs and um, really um, a good choice. Now, if you ever looked at market share, you'd see Angular, um, React is at 40%, Angular is at 23, and it's only at 19. I would say Angular is kind of stagnated and, and Vue is on the way up. Finally, um, we put this out. We just took this as an um, internal thing, and we said, all right, let's give it out um, and try to see if we can grow it uh, with, you know, uh, with a, a group of people community. Um, we just opened it up. Um, it's under the Apache 2. Um, you can go to the GitHub link if you want. Um, things to think about that we haven't, um, when it comes to contributing, is, you know, the basic stuff that we need to do better at, you know, um, I, identity access management, um, whipping up a quick and dirty um, uh, S portal or S bomb portal, so someone can have a free quick and dirty one built on top of it. We have an internal one. I'm not sure that one is easily given out, um, but people can build their own and they can share it. Um, additional um, um, adding additional standard profiles that come along. One of the things we want to do is allow people to easily create a user-defined profiles, and the database will have a little schema type checking, um, extend the API, advanced part searching is going to be really important, and um, extending the, the CLI. So in summary, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are preparing for this onslaught of requests for SBOMs that are just going to be so um, varied, and we're going to be slammed if we don't do something now. And that was to redesign how we store components and then start building the system out towards the formats, as, as opposed to starting with the formats and going backwards. OK? We recommend starting there, making sure it doesn't have to be this catalog. You can create your own catalog. But think about it and get that piece right. I highly encourage you to keep the separation between the intrinsic data and um, extrinsic data. That was one thing we've learned that's been a, a real benefit. It's important to have in your company a single source of truth, a place you can go where every single thing must go in there. Even if everybody else wants to replicate it somewhere else, who cares? But you need a place where all components that go into your products can be stored so that you will have more, you'll be able much more easier to manage that. Um, and actually, you can build many more scalable solutions that way. As I explained throughout the presentation, we support this notion of varying things that could be parts. Um, and then finally, we talked about the metadata and, and, and the technologies used. Okay, with that, um, I'll take questions. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier on the two whole system seconds from start. I just want to have a microphone pass yep. around. This one here. First, yeah. And I just want to make sure it's turned on there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, different profiles, including a crypto profile. Mm -hmm. uh, I will come to steal that from you for the Export Compliance Working Group record chain. Sure. I mean, it's just a list of uh, um, cryptography algorithms found within a, a, a part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. And yes. And I'm now Mike Ritter. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Um, I've also found that terminology is really difficult to align on um, in the comparison you had between 
extrinsic and intrinsic data. You had hardwired dependencies versus dependencies. Can you just explain that a little bit? Sure. When you build a piece of software and you embed inside your, um, you can pull in libraries into your code base and fix them and put them into your code base, they're not going to change on you, right? Then those are considered hardwired. But if you have something that's dynamically determined at build time and it can change, and especially if you use the word latest and you don't know what you're going to get, that's dynamic, right? So what it, you would only store in this thing the things you absolutely know are absolute truths. And if you know that this particular third party component was put in a subdirectory, I think in um, Go they call them vendors, like it's a vendor directory. Then if you embed it inside your, your component, it's intrinsic to the component, you, you can't change. It's, 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 it's factually what it is, then it, it would be considered hardwired. But if you're dynamically determining the dependency at build time, and that can change every time you do a build, that would be dynamic. And that'd be extrinsic. So like ranges of major versions or ranges of minor versions would be? Yes. By the way, we consider every version independently. independent. Different. They're different parts. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, um, I want to thank you guys for joining me on this late hour. <laughs>